Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you so much to the organizers, the Ron House. I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, I've changed the title. The title of the program is Dismantling History, Memory, Identity, and the Cemetery of Jamal uh, Bakri. I've changed the title to Space, Identity, and Jamal Bakri. In the interest of uh, connecting space and memory together, this paper that I'm presenting now is more focused on space and less focused on memory. So, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to read from my computer. Uh, Baqai is an exceptionally important link between spatial ordering and Muslim identities. The, this presentation utilizes an anthropological perspective on space and identity in order to better understand the dynamics of Baqai in the construction of a shared Muslim heritage. Baqai, as a space, occupies an important role in how Shia, Sunnis, and Wahhabis create and maintain their religious identities. The boundaries, rituals, and relations of the cemetery divide these groups according to their collective understanding of Islamic history and orthopraxy. So, in an article on Bakri.org, you can find this, uh, Alam Dalrizvi writes that the preservation of the sacred burial sites in Janaka Bakri is of paramount importance to all believers of the Shia faith. It is the cornerstone of our belief system and must be our number one priority at all times. There are, there are a number of questions here. One, why were the Wahhabis, why are the Wahhabis, so concerned about the shrines in Baqai? And why did the Shia today organize around the cemetery? Why do Muslims care about shrines and holy sites? Moreover, why do Muslims care about space at all? I will argue here that we should read Islam as a spatial religion. In other words, a religion deeply rooted in spatial arrangements. I argue that Muslims have always acted spatially. Today, both Sunni and Shia protest against the destruction of historic sites by the state of Saudi Arabia. Through this destruction, Wahhabi identity defines itself in direct contrast to traditional Muslim identities which are infused with love and respect for historical Islamic sites. These sites are spatial markers of Muslim identities. So, in this presentation, I will outline the Shia and Wahhabi spatialization of religion and temporal authority. For example, Baqai is not only important as a location where four Imams Salam are buried, but also a space, an area formed by spatial discourses and practices. I propose here to read Islam as a spatial religion in order to demonstrate how Muslim identities fashion themselves around sacred space. We've heard a lot about sacredity and space today, and I think this works in very nicely here. In other words, we can read Islam as a religion defined by spaces, and by doing so, we can see how Muslims have ordered their understanding of Islam through the construction and maintenance of those spaces. So, using spatialization as my theoretical framework, I argue that the destruction of Baqai, both in 1806 and 1926, was not merely a smashing of concrete, of iron, of stone, but a process of spatial acting. And so, by doing this, I'm going to develop three different ideas here, spatialization, despatialization, and respatialization. And I'll talk about those more a little later. The, the Saudi Wahhabi Alliance did not remove signs and symbols solely to evacuate the cemetery of its traditional meaning, it, of its traditional meaning, excuse me, but to implant a new alternative meaning onto Baqai. In other words, the Saudis have not simply sought to displace the established Islamic heritage, but actively sought to replace the established, established heritage with a new Wahhabi heritage. Now I'm going to go into the history of Baqai, and I must apologize, I think everyone in this room knows the history probably much better than I do, but I think the history is important to understanding what I'm going to emphasize later. 
so, at the time of Hijrah, when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the early Muslim community traveled to Medina from Mecca, Baqi was a grove of boxthorn trees. This is the most cited reason as to why it's called Baqi. The location was chosen by the Prophet وسلم, to be a cemetery, and he وسلم, purchased the land from two orphans. Following the space's designation, or its spatialization, as a cemetery, many Muslims were buried there. In the years following the death of the Prophet وسلم, the cemetery was maintained and Medina remained the de facto capital of the early Islamic Caliphate. Imam Ali السلام, transferred the capital of the Muslim community to the city of Kufa in 656 <laughs> CE and using all of the Western calendar dates. Unfortunately, I'm very infused in that calendar. Uh, however, Medina remained a city of significance in the Muslim world. Imam Hassan السلام, moved to Medina after advocating temporal authority. Under the Umayyads and the Abbasids, Baqi was expanded and shrines were built over many grave sites. Four Imams, Hassan ibn Ali, alayhi salam, Ali ibn Hussein, alayhi salam, Muhammad al-Baqar, alayhi salam, and Jafar al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, were buried in Baqi during this very early period, while the Umayyads and Abbasids had political power. The Abbasids themselves constructed a shrine for Abbasid and Abdul Muqadid in Baqi, as time went on, the cemetery was regularly enlarged and esteemed Muslims continued to be buried there, including individuals like the Sunni scholar Nadir al-Nas in 795 CE. Over the centuries, Medina changed hands a number of times, from the Zengids and the Seljuks to the Mamluks. In 1517 CE, the Ottomans conquered Medina in the Second Mamluk Ottoman War, and they remained firmly in power until the 19th century CE. Under the Ottomans, Baqi, along with the Prophet's Mosque and other holy sites, continued to be expanded and renovated. In 1806 CE, the Saudi Wahhabi Alliance invaded Hijaz and destroyed the shrines and tombs in Baqi, which they declared to be a heretical spatial arrangement. After the Ottomans recaptured Medina in 1813, Sultan Abdul Hamid II ordered that the shrines be rebuilt, and they subsequently remained until the Saudi Wahhabi Alliance demolished them again in 1926. At the time, there were very few Wahhabis in Medina, and the Sunnis in Medina did not want to destroy Baqi. Therefore, in order to destroy the cemetery, the Saudis forced the Nahawiyya to destroy the shrines. So, that's the history. Getting into Baqi as a space. If Islam is a spatial religion, as I am <coughs> here, then we would expect to see that Muslims would concern themselves with the arrangement and the ordering of space. This is exactly what is taking place. The construction of the shrines in Baqi from the beginning of the Islamic order through to 1806, this, this spatialization, followed the, by the destruction by the Wahhabis the, re the despatialization, the reconstruction by the Ottomans, and the final destruction in 1926 all indicate this obsession with space, not only by the Wahhabis, but also by the Sunnis and the Shia. Space can be central to how one constructs her or his identity. The link between identity and space is usually talked about in anthropology, talked about regarding identity and space that one inhabits. So usually anthropologists, when they talk about space, they talk about a home, they talk about a village, they talk about a city where someone lives. I want to suggest that there can be a strong link between identity and a space that one visits briefly, or maybe that one doesn't even visit at all. So, this link especially applies to Muslim identities. For example, despite the fact that not all Muslims travel to Mecca or Medina or Baqi, they relate themselves to these spaces. Muslims maintain a spatial focus through their religious practices. The spatial focus of Muslim identities is exhibited, for example, by the depiction of holy sites on prayer rugs and pictures of sacred places that adorn the wall of the walls of mosques or homes. Right? Muslims as Muslims we position ourselves in the world through Islamic practices and Islamic spatialization. 
for example. The, lunar, the Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar, right? Based on how the moon rotates around the earth. Prayer times are based on the relation of the sun to the earth. Moreover, prayer requires orienting oneself towards Mecca, right? We came here, the first thing we did was, where's the Pizzolan? Fasting occurs from dawn until dusk, also based on the relative position of the sun to the earth. And then Hajj, Amrah, Ziyarah involve travel between multiple locations and acting spatially at these locations. So we could imagine that these practices, for example, would look very, very different in outer space or on another planet or something like this. And so this creates a, an idea of spatialization in the Muslim mind. I do not want to reduce identity or culture to spatial arrangements, and I also do not want to reduce Islam to spatial arrangements. Instead, the purpose of framing Islam spatially is to shift the perspective and open up new doors to analysis of how Muslims perform the religion. While we cannot reduce Islam to spatial arrangements, we can safely say that Islam is practiced as, as a mode of being in the world. So, once we begin to look at spaces, we must examine how space is created, changed, and or destroyed. And so here are my, my big three theoretical points. Spatialization points to a specific process of creating space and giving that space meaning. As mentioned above, discourses and practices do that. My second theoretical point is despatialization. Despatialization indicates either an alteration, disruption, or a complete removal of that space and its given meaning. And respatialization, my third point, signifies the process of placing a new or a different meaning onto that space. So spatialization, despatialization, respatialization. Re with regard to Balkhaya, spatialization indicates the creation and expansion of the cemetery, along with centuries of shrine building and the renovations. Despatialization points to the destruction of those shrines, and respatialization is shown most clearly by the strict control of the spatial arrangements and practices at the cemetery by the Saudi Wahhabi authorities. The relationship to space is occasionally made explicit by Muslims themselves. After all, the Wahhabis have defended their actions based on the despatialization and respatialization of the Kaaba, for example, in the early Muslim period when the pagan idols were smashed after the conquering of Mecca. Here too was a despatialization of the pagan order and a respatialization in an Islamic framework. This moment embeds the religion in a specific transformation and a relationship to space. So, what we can surmise from this point is that Muslims value certain locations over other locations. Uh, in his book, The Origins of the Shia, Identity, Ritual, and Sacred Space in, the, in 8th century Kufa, Najib Haider describes how the Shia in Kufa quote, developed a religious geography of Kufa that directed worshippers toward a network of friendly venues and away from regions of particular hostility. Today, Shia have developed local and global religious geographies in the same vein. Shrines and mosques have served as poles around which these religious geographies have formed, and additionally, Shia have developed religious geographies that direct worshippers toward friendly countries and away from hostile countries. I would argue that there are actually three layers to this. There's a local spatial geography, a global spatial geography, and a cosmological spatial geography that all play off of each other, but I need to uh, develop that further. Uh, reading Islam as a spatialized religion reveals that religious geographies are also central to the lives of Muslims and how Muslims construct their identities. Spatialization itself involves a wider process than the creation of a single space. Locations, as points on a map, instead form networks that come to define themselves relationally. And these networks themselves embed spatial practices and spatial identities. 
For Shia, for example, there are different locations we could choose. If we had a map here, we could go to Karbala, we could go to Mashhad, we could go to Baghdad, we could go to Samara, and of course we could go to Bakli as well, right? Cities like Diria and Riyadh play an important role for Wahhabi spatial, for Wahhabi religious geographies. And for all Muslims, regardless of sect, the three major cities remain Medina, Mecca, and Jerusalem, which are like stars in a constellation of Muslim religious geography. So my point here is not only that the Shia and the Sunni have spatialized uh, their religions, but also that Wahhabis, Wahhabism itself is a spatialized ideology. So, as only Muslims are allowed to enter the city of Mecca, the Saudi government has spatialized the city, the infrastructure, and the highway in very specific ways. Additionally, for Muslims in Mecca, space is governed by the lack of signs at historic sites, or simply the lack of historic sites altogether, right? In order to reach the Cave of Yura in Mecca, for example, one must follow a trail of litter and graffiti, right? In Mecca, in order to find these historic sites, there aren't big signs that say, go here, go there, here's that, here's that. No, you have to follow Pepsi cans on the ground. Moreover, spatial practices are restricted drastically in many places by gates, fences, and pathways. You can think about the, the gates to the cemetery of Apollo. The ideological ban of shrines on graves and the destruction of historic sites are themselves spatial practices that shape Wahhabi identity. Just as Shia and Sunnis have shaped their identities through facilitating shrine visitation and ziyara, the Wahhabis have shaped their identities through constraining shrine visitation and ziyara. In recent years, Wahhabi spatial practices have even begun to influence Sun other Sunni spatial practices. Spatialization, that's a very difficult word to say, and I have to say it a lot in this presentation. Spatialization is always a process of negotiation and struggle. For example, the Saudi government has turned Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab's house in Vienna into a popular tourist attraction in the museum. This is especially remarkable because the Wahhabi establishment plans to demolish the houses where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself lived. Wahhabis have a specific idea of how space is to be used in government. The removal of historic sites and shrines may appear to have an egalitarian impulse. In death, all bodies are equal. However, the destruction of the grave markers does not annihilate a hierarchy of graves because those buried in Bakhli are already in an elevated position. Additionally, thus far, the Wahhabi establishment has allowed this hierarchy to persist as the first two caliphs are not even buried. Their bodies are tomb, tombs next to the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad Following the Saudi conquest, the cemetery has also become a gendered space. According to Wahhabi doctrine, women are not allowed to pass through the gates. The justification for this gender essentialist Wahhabi belief is that women are too emotional in cemeteries and people are not supposed to be emotional in cemeteries. So women are only allowed to enter the cemetery after they have died. Moreover, this is related to the Wahhabi position against the Shia, who are known, of course, for somewhat emotional mourning ceremonies. The Saudi government strictly enforces Wahhabi interpretations of space. As mentioned above, spaces are sites of multiple readings. Baqi itself is subject to wildly different interpretations. And Wahhabi control over Baqi demonstrates this spatial orientation. Rather than discouraging Muslims from visiting graves through reasoned discourse and discussion or writing books, the Saudi Wahhabi Alliance chose to just raise the monuments, raise the tombs, raise the shrines. They could have written books, they didn't write books, they just destroyed the shrines. So why did the Wahhabis reject the spaces and the spatializations of the Umayyads, of the Abbasids, of the Seljuks, Mamluks, Ottomans? This rejection establishes the novelty of Wahhabi interpretations of space. 
Through despatialization and respatialization, Wahhabis assert themselves as a distinct religious tendency. Wahhabis clearly saw space as a site of struggle, a struggle that they intend to win. Indeed, Wahhabi spatial practices and spatial identities differ from other Muslims in a variety of ways. Firstly, Wahhabism is centered on an idiosyncratic reading of God's attributes, which includes an anthropomorphism not found in Shahi or Sunni texts. Secondly, Wahhabism insists that a grave site has the potential to become a location that disrupts Tawhid. The Wahhabis recognize the meaning and power of spaces for practices and identities. This is why Wahhabis have placed so much emphasis on the destruction of shrines and tombs. If we focus on what replaces these sites, then the spatial transformation of the landscape reveals a process of desacralization that goes, a, goes well beyond a prioritization of Shia. Wahhabi spatialization does not challenge buildings of another order. For example, Shrines are replaced by shopping malls. Houses, dating back to the time of the Prophet وسلم, are replaced by fast food restaurants. And places associated with the lives of the Prophet وسلم, and the Ahlul Bayt and the companions and wives of the Prophet وسلم, are replaced by hotels and car parks. The construction of palaces and skyscrapers are part and parcel of this desacralization and resacralization, right? So now there's this other process about sacredity, not only space. The efforts of the Saudi government to disrupt Shi'i and Sunni spatializations and replace them with Wahhabi spatialization have been ongoing since the birth of the first Saudi state. This process of spatialization has additional layers of sacralization and desacralization that are also worth further analysis. For example, some places are made sacred, like the clock tower in Mecca, which I have seen on prayer rugs, whereas other places are made profane, like the trails of litter that adorn the paths to holy sites around Mecca and Medina. Um, Olivia Roy recognizes this most clearly when he writes that, there, that Wahhabism rejects typical religious sacralization. Roy argues that, quote, this refusal to sacralize places of worship, geographical places, and territories is evident in, he uses the word Salafism, which does not celebrate Ma'ud and Ziyara. The worship of local saints and the sacralization of tombs, even that of the prophets, only Mecca escapes this deterritorialization and only just. <coughs> Salafism picks up on the idea that a mosque is simply a place of prayer only for the duration of the prayer. Right? That's the end of the quote. So, concluding. By offering this reading of Islam on spatial terms, the connection between space, identity, and memory, I think, becomes clear. The deep process of spatialization and respatialization disrupted the relationship between Baqi and Shi'i identities and Sunni identities. This disruption, however, reified the relationship in novel ways. For example, the destruction of Baqi has solidified kind of a new aspect of Shi'i identities, as Shia today have rallied around the cause. Today, it is easy to find appeals in, on the internet, in sermons, at events, particularly by the Shia, to quote unquote, rebuild Ba'i. This popular Shi'i slogan, rebuild Ba'i, which could be read in another way as respatialize Ba'i, uh, is, on the surface, a call to return Ba'i to its previous state under the Ottomans, a Sunni empire, which is interesting when you consider the relationship between different sects. This slogan re reflects the similar spatializations of the Shia and the Sunnis. The slogan also reflects the spatiality of the religion and the bond between space and identity. The Wahhabi interpretation of space, however, is currently hegemonic on the Arabian Peninsula. Under the Saudi government, space is strictly controlled, spatialized, despatialized, respatialized, sacralized, desacralized, and resacralized. 
By carrying out Wahhabi interpretations of space and cemeteries, the Saudi state and the Wahhabi clergy have actively attempted to dislocate Shi'i identities as well as Sunni identities. Thank you. I think it is uh, a call to uh, read the history from the perspective of the spaces. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Uh, we are not just to focus on events, but the spaces even are uh, sometimes stronger than events to uh, uh, give us the meaning of what has happened during the history and what is alive today. Because the spaces stay at the place, but events just are in the Stories of books. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we told, um, uh, spaces are not only located at a point in geography, but within the frameworks and borders of ideology. And every ideology just tries to give it a meaning and make it for itself. And about Babi, uh, the destruction of uh, Babi. By Bahá'ís, I think, uh, gave it uh, even a stronger meaning for Shia. Because before it, Babi was a place like Karmala and Najaf and Mashhad. But nowadays, Babi is not just like Karmala and Najaf. It has a stronger meaning. It means uh, a problem that, that is remaining on the place. Not every Shia can think about Babi and the, the message will, will be understood and comprehended completely with him. And I think the radicalism of the ideology of Wahhabi, uh, this destructive approach, have formed in a completely different way. And we can say now that he is even more important. And that is not what this ideology of the hobby was expected to be uh, realized. Mm -hmm. And then Mali is alive and even more strong. Yeah, I, 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 um, I brought that up in the, in the, in the presentation. In, in a way, it sort of reified Shi'i identity, I think, in, in very interesting ways, um, which maybe were not predictable, but maybe were, because I, I do know that the Shia in, in India offered uh, King Abdulaziz something like what, what is today the equivalent of three million pounds to not destroy the tomb, the tombs in, in Bali. So there, I mean, there, there was this relationship there already, even while the Shia in India. I'm sorry. Shia in India offered that amount. No, the Shia in India. In India. Yeah. From what I've seen. From what I've seen. Um, uh, offered that amount for them not to destroy uh, the, the tombs in Bali. Um, interestingly. The, the thing that I, I, I don't know if, if that was in consideration as much as the idea was to control the space and, and in a way, by controlling the space in the way that they did, they also, it seems to me, kind of successfully disrupted the relationship between the Sunnis and, and Bapai. So for example, when, when you find this, this, this slogan, rebuild Bapai, everywhere. Generally, the people talking about Bapai are Shia, mm -hmm. from what I've seen. I don't know, maybe, maybe others have seen more. Um, and when, I, when I've talked to my Sunni friends about this, they, they kind of didn't have an idea of what had happened and what was going on, and some of them didn't even know that there used to be shrines in Bapai. I, I myself went, I, I made Umrah in 2012 as a very, very new Muslim. And when I went to Bapai, I myself didn't know that there had been shrines there. 
So I went into Pompeii thinking, oh, this is what it has looked like for 1,400 years, which was when, when I got home and started researching Pompeii. It was very new information for me to see pictures of these old beautiful shrines and everything else. I think, I think in some ways uh, they succeeded in what they wanted to do. I think in some ways they have been successful. Maybe the shrines are not there. Yeah. But, but the memory of the shrines, I think, is stronger than the shrines. Right. But what's the benefit of shrine? The shrine should give you a, a message. It's like a sign. Mm -hmm. but, but the sign is stronger in the mind. Then, then I think Bari nowadays is playing the role that was supposed to play it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We have three questions and little, or four questions and little time left. Yes, thank you very much for your lecture. I have questions. First of all, as we know, Darvish or IS is also trying to destroy the Shia shrines in Karbala and uh, Syria and so on. Can we consider this as a con continuation of what happened to Al Badi and somehow a continuation of Saudi Arabic? Arabic uh, states doctrine, and this is my first question. And my second question is whether the, uh, uh, whether the destruction of Al Badi is can be considered especially for oppression and and um, uh, discrimination of Shia people, or is it only because of their um, ideological point of view that graves should be uh, destroyed at all, no matter whether it's uh, significant for Shia or for Sunni. For example, as I said before, also the graves of companions of the Prophet uh, are destroyed and um, are made up um, to um, shopping malls and so on. So I would like to know whether it is especially for discriminating Shia or is it because um, generally they are against uh, yes. Dr. Rizky? Your question. Yeah, um, there are a couple of really simple uh, discursive ways in which you can look at this question of uh, despatialization and perhaps respatialization. Uh, when you go to Bakhi, uh, the, the classic refrain you get from these people who are uh, allegedly university graduates uh, is that there is nothing here. That's the phrase, there is nothing here. Yeah. Um, and uh, the way in which the response is that the people go there and they actually um, uh, recite Ziyarat. And the recitation of the Ziyarat is obviously an affirmation that there is something there. So uh, it's interesting how these things discursively play out. So, so it's um, uh, the, the fact that you don't have like a, a body or something like that actually does not matter with respect to how people Related to it. And of course, we also now know that, uh, you know, even Sunnis, when they go, they have a map of who's where and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, a lot of people who have been going for the last 10 years have been geotagging stuff. So if you have Google Earth or Google Maps, you can basically, uh, even if you didn't have this physical map, you'd be able to find the sites very wow. easily. Yeah. And I remember when I went in 2012, we went around geotagging. Everything in the middle, like uh -huh. not just in Bakhi, like across the city. Uh, because we had a lovely uh, chap who took us around mm -hmm. and said, Oh, this used to do this. this so we geotagged everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's super interesting. So that's re specialization? <laughs> you have Yes, I, I wanted uh, to uh, say that uh, what Mr. Mumano said, I agree also. Because I was, I was also there in Bali 10 years ago and um, from the feeling, from the spirituality, I, I, I didn't miss much. Even the, 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 the mosque one on the way, I think it, does, it didn't lose the meaning and the spirituality and the feeling that, that this, very, this place is very Mohatas. Dr. Singh. 
مكة والمدينة أو هي ليست مشكلة في حظ مكة والمدينة أن الذين تسلطوا أو أداروا هذه المنطقة هم كانوا شوافع من الشافعية مثل مثل محمد بن يزيد الشافعي مثل محمد بن يزيد الشافعي لم يعارض بناء الأضرحة بل العكس يعني كما الحال في في مصر وفي سوريا وفي بلاد الشام وحتى في بلاد البلاد العربية كان أصحاب هذا المذهب يعتبرون أن كرامات الأولياء هي الأمور المحببة والتي تدين هذه الواسطة ولكن المشكلة أنه تغير إدارة مذهب هذه المنطقة إلى المذهب الحنبلي المتطرف اللي هو المذهب الوهابي كان هو السبب المباشر في أن لا تبقى هذه الأضرحة لذلك انا قلت لسؤال الاخ الفضل الدكتور عادل قبل قليل قلت له ان الاماره التي اسست على قبور امه البقيه لم تكن لم يقم بها الشيعه مطلقا بل كانت عماره قام بها المماليك نعم هناك عماره فاطميه ولكن ربما اندثرت هذه العماره وجددت نعم ولكن الذين قاموا بهذه العماره هم الايوبيون وكذلك المماليك واخر عماره وحتى العثمانيون. لذلك نجد انا حتى الدكتور عادل فقط لذلك نجد هنالك الطرز المعماري التي بنيت بها امنيه الربيع تختلف اختلافا كبيرا عن الطرز المعماري التي بنيت بها مراقبه العتبات في العراق وفي ونشاهد هنالك واحد ان القبور التي تكون قبور الاولياء التي بنيت في الشام هي تحاكي نفس الطراز الذي بنيت في مكه والمدينه لان الذي بناها نفسهم الاماليك الايوبيين والاماليك وكذلك So the, the, first, the first question was, do I think Daesh is, is a continuation of, of this despatialization, respatialization in, um, done by the Saudis? Yes. I think it's the same. I think it's the same process, and I think that shows the, why, this, why I think my theoretical framework is useful. Because I think this spatialization, despatialization, respatialization, I think this process is important to understanding how Muslims engage with space, how Muslims associate their identity with space, etc. And so do I think it's, it's spatial oppression or just a theological point? Probably both. Probably if it's if it if Muslims are associating our identities, our practices, our discourses on space, that if that space is changed, or if the spatial ordering is changed, or the discourse is changed, or the practices are changed, then you're trying to change something that other people are doing, right? If the Saudis or Daesh destroy the shrines, there's a goal there. Right? If they wanted to discourage people from going, they could write books. Like I said, they could write books. They could have, they have arguments with people. They could engage in what people did for 1,400 years in the Muslim world. Talk. But they don't do that. Right? They take a sledgehammer and... Yeah, but we know that, for example, they both start sort of... No, but we don't have any time. So, uh, I'm sorry that I have to interrupt you. That's okay. We'll talk about this. <laughs> 